Welcome to Substantial Authorities, a tax podcast brought to you by the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law Tax Program, recognized as a leader in its field, ranked in the top four annually every year since 2005, preparing students for careers in federal, state, and international tax law. Substantial Authorities, the tax podcast, brings to you conversations with leading tax figures on matters relating to tax administration, tax controversy, and tax litigation. I'm your host, Matt Frank. Welcome to the conversation. Hi, and welcome to Substantial Authorities, a tax podcast. I'm your host, Matt Frank, a partner at the law firm Steptoe & Johnson, LLP. I'm here today with Al Meiji. Al is a partner at the Canadian-based law firm Osler, Hoskin & Harcourt. Al is widely recognized as the top tax litigator in Canada, an informal title he's held for many years. Al is a chartered accountant. He received his law degree from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and a master in law from Harvard Law School. Al started his career in the early 1990s at, at the uh, tax litigation section of the Canadian Department of Justice, where he stayed for about six years. He then left and went to a law firm in Calgary uh, before going to a different law firm in Toronto and joining Osler's in 2002, where he's practiced for the last 20 years. Al has been lead counsel in many of Canada's most important and high-profile tax cases. He has appeared frequently before the Canadian Supreme Court, arguing successfully in several landmark cases there. This included the Shell Canada case in 1999 that addressed uh, economic substance and tax avoidance, the 2005 Canada Trust Co. case, which addressed the Canadian general anti-avoidance rule, and the 2012 Supreme Court case GlaxoSmithKline, which was the first and today only transfer pricing case uh, decided by the Canadian Supreme Court. Al's transfer pricing litigation uh, extends beyond GlaxoSmithKline. He was a lead trial counsel in the GE Capital Canada case decided by the tax court in 2009, affirmed by the Court of Appeals in 2010, and was also trial counsel in the Cameco case decided by the tax court in 2018, affirmed on appeal in 2020. Between the two, he was appellate counsel in the McKesson Canada case. Uh, which received a fair amount of press in the 2014-15 time frame. Al, thanks very much for being here. Matt, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. I've given a very high overview of your career, but I'd like to start, go back to the beginning and, and ask you a question. What brought you to law, to Harvard, to tax, and to the Department of Justice? Well, um, before I went to law school, I was a CPA. Um, we used to call them CAs in Canada, but they're CPAs. Um, and I practiced with a couple of the big four uh, firms in the tax groups. And I, I got to a point where I, I felt that I just needed a change. Um, I wanted to do, I wanted to do something different. And, um, and I just woke up one morning and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to apply to law schools and see where it goes. And I got into law school and packed up my little car and drove across the country and started law school. So that's how I ended up at Dalhousie University Law School in Nova Scotia, which is exactly on the on the East Coast, very far away from, from Calgary, where I was living at the time. And uh, when I went to law school um, to get my first degree, uh, the JD, um, I took a whole variety of courses. I was interested. I, wasn't, I, was, I didn't go to law school to become a tax lawyer. I went to law school to become a lawyer. And I was very open-minded in, in how, um, and, and, and sort of seeing how things unfolded. And, um, and then I finished there, and I ended up you know, I, I left there, and I was I went to I, I went to a to the federal court of appeal in Ottawa to clerk, and I clerked for a judge. Uh, and the federal court of appeal is the appellate court that deals with tax cases. So I saw a lot of tax there. And then um, when I was there, um, I decided to see if I could go to Harvard and do a master's in law. Sounded like a great idea at the time, and and I did that. So I, I never really set out to be a tax lawyer or tax litigator after I left accounting, it just, I just, the opportunities came along and I took advantage of them. When you went to Harvard, well, spend a little bit more time about what, what led you to Harvard. Why, why did that appeal to you and what was your ambition at the time? Well, uh, when, I, when I finished my first degree in law and finished clerking, I was seriously thinking about an academic career. Um, I really liked law school. Law school was wonderful for me. Um, and, and I thought that an academic career would be very fulfilling. 
and to be an academic, to be, to to get an appointment at a Canadian law school, you have to had you have, you have to have, have a graduate degree. And so, I was clerking for a judge who went to Harvard, and um, you know he encouraged me to to apply and wrote a very strong, uh, I understand, reference letter and. Um, and, um, you know, I applied to two or three schools and picked Harvard, and that's how I ended up there. Did you go directly from Harvard to the tax litigation section? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, when I finished at Harvard, I was supposed to go back to Calgary to a law firm to start practicing, really, to, to practice as a solicitor, as a tax lawyer. Because by then I sort of thought, okay, I know a lot of tax, and this is, this is, uh, this is something that will work for me. But it just so happened that the year I finished at Harvard, my wife got an appointment as a clerk in the Supreme Court of Canada. And so that meant that we had to go to Ottawa so that she could you know, do her clerkship. And when I went back to Ottawa, uh, I needed a job. And so I thought, I'm going to try out the Department of Justice for a year until my wife finishes her clerkship, and then we'll move back to, you know, to the West. And uh, that is when I truly fell in love with the business I'm in. And I, I really didn't intend to stay for very long. I, was, I thought of it as a year when she was finishing her clerkship and I was getting some exposure to tax litigation and then I'd go back to work, what I was thinking of doing. But it turned out to be such a magnificent year that I didn't end up leaving for, for six. Had you committed yourself to litigation? Is that what led you to the tax litigation section or, or did it make you a convert? It made me a convert. I, I, I remember a conversation that I had with my judge, the judge I clerked for. When I came back from Harvard, he asked me, he says, well, what are you going to be doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going back to Alberta to join a law firm, and I'm going to practice as a tax lawyer. And I remember, the, I, I remember the conversation I had with him like it was yesterday, and he looked at me and he said, that's a terrible idea. Uh, and he said, look, uh, you really need to try litigation. You really need to spend some time in a courtroom uh, because I think you're going to enjoy it. And, seems to, and he said, and I, th I think that's, that's, more, that's more suitable for for what I know of you. And he then encouraged me. He said, you know, you, you worked with me. You were, we were working on all, this, all these tax cases. You know, you, you know, you have a pretty good grasp of it. And here in Ottawa, there's the tax litigation section of the Department of Justice. And all they do is tax cases. So why don't you try that? It'll allow you to bring the two together. And I, I mean, he's the guy who recommended it. He's the judge who suggested it to me. And so I thought, okay. And I, I basically, you know, talked to the folks at the Department of Justice and landed a job there and started as the new kid um, in, 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 that, in that section of, of the Department of Justice. And it was, it was a really great run for the years I was there. What is it that grabbed you? Well, you know, Matt, it's interesting. The day that I showed up uh, for my, my first day at the Department of Justice, uh, the deputy attorney general at the time, who had a huge influence on my career, he, he, had a, he had a case that was headed to the Supreme Court of Canada. And it had this really interesting, almost academic tax law issue about whether strike pay was taxable, you know. Um, and he said to me, um, I, on the first day I showed up, he said, you know, uh, here, I want you to put, to put together the brief for the Supreme Court of Canada on this question. We're going up and I want you to, you know, be co-counsel with me on the case. This is, this is my first day in the Department of Justice. Uh, or in the first couple of months of the Department of Justice, he handed me that file. And, um, and so I just got into it. And all of a sudden, uh, it was interesting. It was fun. I, um, I was spending time with litigators. We were having these great conversations. And, um, and I just started thinking about, how, you know, th this is, I, I became, I became, I don't know if obsessed is the right word, but it's pretty close with the whole business of, of litigation. And then the subject matter appealed to me because I had a great deal of familiarity with it to begin with. And that's how it started. Do you remember your first meaningful time in court? Uh, yes. And, you know, it's so interesting because it's a case that I lost. And to this day, I, I don't know how I lost that case because it made no sense. It, it was an interesting case where... Uh, an individual had been hired by a company, and and he he was supposed to start work. He was a he was a I think a mid level executive, and um, he was supposed to start work in a couple of months. And before he started work, he was fired. So he got a check, a severance check, or you know some sort of a compensation for the termination. And the question became whether this was taxable, 
whether this was something that was in the nature of income or was it uh, a non-taxable receipt. And to this day, I think to myself, that's easy. This thing is taxable. And I lost. And, uh, and I have, you know, and I've gone back and thought about how did you manage to steal defeat from the jaws of victory? This should have been so easy for you. And so I remember it very clearly uh, because it, you know, the loss has stayed with me uh, even today, even to, to this day. And, uh, you know, but I learned a lot from it. So it's hard to see where the factual dispute was in that case, why it was not just submitted on paper. I think it was, well, that's in, in our courts, oral advocacy is the rule. Uh, we don't do much by, uh, by, by advoca- you know, advocacy in writing. Uh, it was a formal trial. He was called. He testified. You know, it was a whole thing. Um, I mean, I, I don't, it, the case is so old. I don't remember all the nuances, but, but it was largely, the facts were largely not in dispute. Uh, but, you know, he, he and his trial counsel were very effective in painting this story of, you know, I didn't do anything to earn this money. I just accepted an offer. I didn't provide any services. I didn't show up for the job. They got nothing out of me. This is really in the nature of, you know, uh, damages. It's not in the nature of any form of compensation. And so it doesn't have the character of income. I, I remember that sort of being the narrative. And I think that um, I, um, I, I suppose I was overconfident. I was sure that this, this case was, was a waste of time, and it didn't work out that way. So you were there for six years. I assume you had no litigation experience before joining the tax litigation section. None whatsoever. How long did it take to, for you to get your feet under you? Um, you know, not long, because, because I was a, um, when I was in law school, I did a lot of moot courts, and I, I've never actually felt uncomfortable on my feet. It, it's something that I've, I, I don't know, I mean, is it, is it a gift? Is it an, it is some, is it an ability? But I, I've never really struggled with, uh, with the idea of being on my feet and, you know, arguing. And, and I remember when I was in law school, we had a, a moot. It was called the Smith Shield. It was a, it was a very very. It was the biggest moot competition, and the way that it ended, uh, the way that it, it worked was they would pick the four. Uh, they would have a sort of a round of moots, and then they would pick the four most successful uh, advocates, and the uh, and the finals would be a moot court where you would argue the case in front of judges of the court of appeal. And it was and it was a big occasion. There would be a party, and there would be the the, the courtroom would be packed, and and I was one of those four, and I ultimately I ended up winning that contest, and and you know so it it was sort of it was sort of part of my, my part of I, I was in a very comfortable place, and so I never really struggled with the business of being on my feet. Looking back at your six, was it six years? Yeah. Any highlights or lowlights? Um, I think that the highlights, first of all, I, I always say that the six years that I spent at the Department of Justice were, were near the, the most rewarding years I've ever had practicing law. Um, I was in an environment which was very dynamic. I was with people who were there because they loved what they did. Uh, they were there because they were committed to the public interest and public service. Uh, they were fun. Um, we all had a sense of purpose. You know, we, we all, and there was a certain swagger in the place. The cases were extraordinarily interesting. There was never a shortage of great cases. That's one of the pleasures of working with the Department of Justice is you're never going to say, I'm not getting great cases and the chance to get on my feet and be an advocate. So I, I, I just found the whole place to be, uh, to be pretty, uh, and, and, and the most senior uh, litigators were very, were very remarkable and accomplished advocates. And, and I learned a lot from them. I mean, they taught me uh, a lot of what I know. I think I learned more from those senior lawyers. Those were the years that shaped me as an advocate. And when I went to the private sector, I was just taking all the lessons I learned from there and applying them on the other side. 
You say there's no shortage of cases, but did you ever feel that the volume of cases which was such that you had to compromise sort of the quality of your, your performance in any case? No. Um, I think what happened to me was, I mean, I consider myself, you know, most of what's, and I'm not, this isn't intended to be false modesty, most of the good things that have happened to me are really a product of chance and circumstance and luck. And I consider, and the Department of Justice time is an indication of that, I arrive there at a time when some of the big questions of Canadian tax law are just being uh, discussed. Uh, I end up working for a deputy attorney general who immediately uh, took, you know, basically expressed confidence in me, gave me opportunity. Um, and. And I came there because I came there with a background in the sense that I practiced as a CPA, so I understood fundamental accounting. I practiced in the tax groups of two big four firms. So I had an understanding of complicated tax law and transactions. And then I had just come from Harvard where my thesis in my graduate school year was the Canadian GST, which was being introduced that year. So I arrive at the Department of Justice with a lot of background in complex tax law issues. And the people I work for recognize that and they immediately say, you know, you're the guy to do this case because it involves these complicated issues and you have all of this background. So all of that comes together and I'm just getting great file after great file after great file. And, um, you know, and I just, I'm, and I, I'm working very hard because I'm not turning any of them away. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm just, uh, there's so much good stuff and I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to devote all the hours necessary because I'm, uh, I'm just completely taken by all of the stuff that I'm doing. Why did you leave? Um, you know, I, I was there for f six years and um, I was from the West and um, one day, I just got a call from a law firm, the biggest law firm in Alberta. The head of tax phoned me and said, you know, we know you're from Alberta. We know this is home. Uh, and we'd like you to come here and start our tax litigation practice. They, didn't, they, had, they, had, they had litigators who did some tax, but they didn't have a focused tax litigation practice. And I had done a lot of cases for the Department of Justice, or some cases for the Department of Justice in the oil and gas space, and I'd been successful. So when he phoned, we started thinking about, you know, maybe we need to go west. We need to go back home. And uh, frankly, the economics were way more attractive than working for the Department of Justice. My wife and I were both, you know, we've been in Ottawa for five years. Uh, she's from the west. And, and, you know, we thought maybe it's time to try something new. Uh, so I really left with a bit of I wasn't sure I was making the right decision. In fact, most nights I, I thought I was making the decision, uh, that, a decision that wasn't right. But I always took comfort in knowing that I have nothing to lose. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to come back. Right? I always believed that I could come back. And so I thought I'd just go out and try it. And so I left thinking, I'll try this and see how it goes. If it doesn't work, I'll come back. How was the transition? Um, it was interesting. I'll tell you a, a little anecdote about that. When I arrived at uh, this firm in, in Alberta, which is a very prominent firm, I got a case that um, was an exceptionally aggressive tax avoidance transaction. A case that if I had been given at the Department of Justice, I would have been outraged that a taxpayer thought they could get away with this. So that was one of the early cases I got. And I remember sitting in a boardroom with uh, couple of senior partners and talking about this and I was pontificating about the about you know how questionable all of this was and and I was I was really I suppose not just pontificating but maybe lecturing on how this was uh, this was unacceptable I hadn't quite gotten out of my mindset and one of the senior partners looked at me and said you know Mr. Meiji welcome to the firm and to be clear I'll never forget these words to be clear we are not paying you to indulge your morality. <laughs> I, I thought that was a great line. It was, it was very, um, and, and it was, he was annoyed, frankly, at my, at my sort of approach to this. So it was a bit of an adjustment, but it wasn't very long before I realized that, 
you know, I'm really just doing the same thing that I was doing for the Department of Justice in that I'm just advocating. I'm not deciding these things. I don't have the weight uh, of a decision maker. Uh, I, I am here to do what I do well, or I thought I did well, which is, you know, passionately advocate a perspective. And soon thereafter, I fell into that, and, and it, it became quite easy. Well, but when you're litigating for the DOJ, I expect you, you spoke about you and your colleagues believing in your mission. Yeah. Of course, your mission there is not to win. It's to do justice. It's to, it's to uh, uh, reach a result that achieves the right amount of tax, not the most amount of tax. Do you agree? No. Um, I, no of course, that is. Of course, that's the stated mission of the Department of Justice. And of course, it's, um, it's the right mission. And of course, that's the way it ought to be. But you know, um, in the throes of litigation, you, 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 of course, want to do the right thing. But, you know, most often you, you don't have much trouble uh, believing that the right thing is the outcome that, that you win, you know. So, so I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, I know that's often said about the Department of Justice. And I, and I think that the Department of Justice lawyers that I worked with, and, 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 and that includes me, we all acted in good faith in that ideal. But we always believed that the right outcome was, uh, was the, the government's position. And it was very, I mean, yeah, there were occasions when I would pick up the phone and call the Canada Revenue Agency and say, you know, this is not, this is, you're on the wrong side of this one and we ought to concede, or you're on the wrong side and we ought to settle. But that was very infrequent. Most of the time, we pretty much believed that, that the right outcome was the one we were arguing for. Without divulging any case names, in retrospect, you've had now 20, a quarter century to reflect on, on the positions you advanced uh, in the DOJ. Any cases you, from a distance now you think you would have conceded in whole or in part or approached differently with, with that perspective? Um, you know, I've never really thought about that question. Um, I mean, I've thought a lot about what I would, you know, in retrospect, w what I would have done differently. Um, but I've never actually thought of a case that I would have conceded or I would have resolved differently. Um, most of the reflections I've had are about how I was, you know, I took the litigation as war metaphor a bit too far. You know, the swashbuckling public interest lawyer a bit too far. But then, you know, I, I was young. And uh, one thing that time does is it changes temperament. It, it, uh, brings a, it brings a certain calmness of spirit and perspective. And so I would, if I could go back, I would change some of that. But I'm not really sure that I, I can think of a specific case where I would have done something differently. So for law students or young lawyers starting their career, maybe you can give some cautionary examples. You say you, you took things too far on, on occasion. Are there any examples you're willing to share? Yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think that um, I remember a case that I argued. Um, and, um, you know, and again, there are cases that you always, you, you, speaking for myself, I, I remember the cases I lost more than the cases I won because losses are more memorable and painful than wins are. And I remember I was arguing a case. It was a trial, three or four day trial, and the and the issue was there was a, a, a one of the a taxpayer had written off a lot of losses from a horse farm that he owned, and the horse farm was it was a hobby. It was it was really not a business, or at least that's that was my case. That this person loves horses. Horses are expensive, and he owns an acreage, and he. You know, and he, he incurred massive losses. And these are not deductible losses. These are personal expenses. That was the case. And I was absolutely right. They were, they were personal expenses. But I remember very clearly, um, and I lost. And I lost the case. And I know why I lost. I lost the case because my cross-examination of the taxpayer was so over the top so uh, lacked any compassion, uh, was so unmeasured. And I was a young guy at the time, so I, I'm, you know, I forgive myself now. But, 
that it, 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 it got to the point where the judge took such, became so protective of this person and so annoyed with me. And I could, now that when I think back, I could see it in his body language. You know, I had won the cross. The best thing to do was to sit down, to go quietly into the night, you know. I didn't even need to do a lethal cross-examination. The facts spoke for themselves, but I, I was determined to show, to show the judge that I was very good and that this taxpayer, and it wasn't enough to hand him a defeat. It was, it was, it, I was going to go all the way. To and humiliation. To humiliation. I, I, I think maybe humiliation is a bit strong, but, uh, but, but I think it was, it was a cross-examination that was a bit too far. And I think the judge became so annoyed at me and developed such an empathy for the taxpayer that the taxpayer won. He wrote a judgment. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I remember seeing him in, um, in a bookshop uh, a little while after that. And he was pretty friendly. And he said, you know, Mr. Meiji, you're a good lawyer, but, uh, but uh, you need to settle down a bit or something to that effect. You know, he kind of he suggested to me that, that I needed to... I needed to back off a bit in terms of how, uh, how I approach some of these cases. But again, those were early years, right? So, so I, I sort of think if I was to say to a young lawyer that you shouldn't think about litigation using the war metaphor anymore, number one, it was never really right in the first place. But secondly, culturally, we've changed. We're a different, we're, we're, you know, culturally, the world is different and the swashbuckling aggressive alpha litigator is, 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 a, is a thing of the past. If it ever was real, it's a thing of the past. I think that there is a, there is a, it's, 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 you know, it's more, it's a more, it's a more thoughtful, quieter, reflective, measured process. It's a, you know, you should think of litigation as about shedding, you know, about shedding light as opposed to generating heat, you know. And I think that comes from, from developing certain habits of the mind, developing certain temperaments, uh, making yourself um, a little less relevant to the process and making the issues and the case and the intellectual aspects of the debate more relevant to the process. To what extent is this a function of your audience? Your litigation experience, I expect, mostly before a judge. Yes. A seasoned professional and not before a jury. Do, do you draw a distinction there in terms of the advice you give for the approach you just outlined? Well, we don't have jury trials in Canada in, uh, in anything except criminal matters. So jury trials are much more common in the United States on a various, on, in various cases than in Canada. So, but just speaking from, so I, I actually have never done a jury trial, but um, I, I, I think there is a difference, but I suspect that uh, if in my younger days, with the way that in my earlier days, that I had all the skills necessary to alienate a jury just as effectively as a judge. You know, perhaps the jury might have been a bit more tolerant and a bit more entertained uh, but uh, I think even they would have had, uh, they would have had limits uh, in terms of how far you go. Staying with the sort of high-level retrospective on the last 30 years, has there been a case that's been most important to you or a moment in a case? You know, I've done so many, I've done quite a few very large and complicated cases. Um, so, but, but when I think about moments... Uh, in cases that have, you know, that have stuck with me, um, you know, and, 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 and there are some, but I'll, I'll relate one to you, which, which was, um, I was arguing GlaxoSmithKline in the Supreme Court of Canada. And in our Supreme Court, oral argument is one hour. So it's a full hour of oral argument, which is much more than the United States, of course. And so you get to, you get to develop your argument orally and I was in full flight, and I was, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time, Beverly McLaughlin, was asking me some questions. And she was clearly focused, you know, their job, just like the job of the United States Supreme Court, is they're going to write a decision which is not just about the particular facts. They're going to write a decision which is 
basically telling the other courts what they're supposed to do. So ha they're writing something a bit broader. They're, their, their whole idea is to, you know, lay out the law and the governing principles, etc. So she and I were engaged. She was asking me a series of questions. And, and I sort of was struggling with some of her questions because I was focused entirely on my case. And I wasn't as focused on the job she was trying to do, which is to, to yeah, she needed to answer the question in my case, but she needed a broader understanding of the law. She needed to understand the legislation you know, more broadly than how it might apply to my specific facts. And, and I was, I was, there was a moment where, you know, she, I could sense that I wasn't, I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really connecting. And I was wondering why, and she paused and she said to me, and these words have stuck with me forever. She said to me, you know, Mr. Meiji, your job is to educate us. It is, pretty, it, it is a startling moment when a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada has to tell an advocate before the court what their job is. You know, and she was very polite. Uh, and the way she said it uh, was it, it, it actually made, I, I remember sort of just pausing uh, because of the way she said it and her body language. And she clearly communicated that the message to me was, you know, you're doing fine with your case but I need some help on the broader legislation. So that stuck with me. That's been, and, and that was very educational. And that was, you know, when I was, when I was a senior guy. So you always learn something. Uh, the second case that I want to talk about, the second moment, and this is probably the most dramatic moment in my entire litigation career. I was in the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called Daishawa, which, uh, which was a case that uh, that had had an impact on the whole sort of the the forestry um, sector, the oil and gas sector. It was a very very significant case, and I was appearing as an intervener or what you would describe as amicus counsel on behalf of the Canadian oil and gas sector. Uh, so I was I appeared there, you know, um, not not as a party but as an intervener. And the process in the Supreme Court is you get 10 minutes of oral argument. You file a brief, and then as an intervener, you get to make 10 minutes of argument. So you're not, you're not really supposed to insinuate yourself in the process too much. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're just there for 10 minutes to say a few things. Uh, but the parties are, it's their case, and they're to carry it. So, so I stood up and did my 10 minutes of submission on why the... Uh, government's case was incorrect. I just added to what the taxpayer argued. The taxpayer was on their feet for an hour. I argued for 10 minutes. I sat down. And then the government's lawyers argued for an hour. And then the taxpayer's lawyer got 15 minutes to do reply. And the case was over. And the Chief Justice started out by saying, thank you. We are going to reserve. And you're going to hear from us. But before she finished saying that, one of the judges interrupted her and said, Madam Chief Justice, I have a question for Mr. Meiji. Now, I was done. I had done my 10 minutes, uh, I, and I was startled because it had never happened in the history of the Supreme Court. So it was, it was completely out of the blue. And I was startled, and I remember, uh, I still remember my reaction, which was, I, I have no idea where this is going, but it can't be good. And so I went up to the podium to address the court, and the judge who asked me, who asked to put the question to me, was M Mr. Justice Marshall Rothstein, a prominent, prominent uh, jurist who's written some of the biggest tax cases in Canada. He's, he's regarded as probably the most influential Supreme Court judge on tax matters. And he put the question to me, and he said, well, Mr. Meiji, the government says this. What do you say in answer to the government's case? And that was odd because that wasn't my job. That was the, the, the taxpayer's lawyer's job. They were supposed to do the reply. And so I was up there for another, I don't know, 15 minutes answering these questions, which were completely out of the blue. And I remember that moment. If there was a moment when, you know, you asked me about how comfortable I am on my feet. If there was one moment when I had, I wasn't so sure it was that because it was so out of the blue, but it went well. Uh, we were successful. The taxpayer won. And uh, the best part of the story is a few years later, Marshall Rothstein stepped down from the Supreme Court and joined our firm as counsel. So, and he's still with us. So, you know. 
if I lived through that experience, I'd have a different takeaway, which is that that's the highest compliment you can be paid. I, I, I think that's fair, and I'm grateful for that. I think it, it, I, I'd like to think that the court had some confidence that I would have something to say that would help them. Uh, but, and, and I do remember, um, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. The, when I was sitting next to my co-counsel at the time was a partner uh, who is now a judge of the tax court. And as soon as Marshall Rothstein, uh, Justice Marshall Rothstein, asked me to come to the podium to address the question, she leaned over and said, don't screw this up. So, so it is a compliment, and I'm grateful for it, but it, it was a moment which was a bit of a, you know, but what, what does that tell us? That tells us that things can happen. Things can happen in litigation. You know, when you're in a courtroom, uh, nothing is, uh, things are unpredictable, and you have to respond to the moment. You, you mentioned the Canadian Supreme Court is pretty generous with allowing allotting time for advocates, a full hour, which is twice as much as the U.S. Supreme Court allots. Explain uh, the allotment of time for arguments at the Court of Appeals and your approach to, uh, to those. Uh, the Court of Appeal is a lot more flexible. I mean, they, they, they have restrictions, but it would, be, it would be very surprising if you couldn't persuade the Court of Appeal to give you, you know, three hours to argue a case. Uh, often you can persuade them to give you a day to argue your case, very rarely two days. But you, you should be able to, in a typical case, get you know, maybe two or three hours, up to five or six hours. Um, and so the, the court, you know, I, I don't think, the, I, I've, never ex I've never thought that the problem at the Court of Appeal is you don't have enough time. I think the problem at the Court of Appeal is you, don't, you may not have enough of a discipline to keep it short because you have so much time that you, that you might be tempted to fill it. And this is a game of diminishing returns, you know. Uh, your returns are high early and they continue to diminish as, you, as the argument goes on. And you, you do hit a point where you start seeing negative returns if you're not careful. So. I'm, and, and you get to request the amount of time you want. So I'm very careful in how much time I ask for. So sometimes I'll say, you know, it'll, I just need an hour. And that sends the right message. That sends the message that I'm going to be concise. This is not hard. And I'm confident that I can persuade you in an hour. So I think, you know, it's part of the, the, whole, the whole sort of shaping the way that you're going to pitch something. You practice in Canada, but you were trained in the United States, and you're familiar with U.S. practice to a degree. In the U.S. Court of Appeals, they limit you strictly, each side to 20 minutes. So that creates quite a, uh, quite a difference from the Canadian practices. Does that reflect, in your view, a different view as to the Court of Appeals' role in Canada versus the United States? Um, no. I think that the reason, if I were to offer an explanation for why these differences might exist, and this is a theory... I would suggest that the reason is that, you know, we are, I, we are very much influenced by the United Kingdom. Oral advocacy in the United Kingdom courts can go for days. I mean, I recently watched an appeal argued uh, in the UK courts. It was, a, I thought, a pretty straightforward issue. And the taxpayer was given three days to argue a case. And they, I mean, they... You know, they went through the record meticulously and they restated the facts and they summarized the case and they reviewed each authority. So, so oral advocacy, the tradition of oral advocacy that comes from the UK is still part of our culture. But we've also been tempered by the US experience. So I think we're, we're influenced by both sides. We don't have you know, we have, we, have, we have a lot of the UK, we have a lot of the UK cultural perspective and practice, but, but we're also, we've also picked up some from the United States. You've told law students and young lawyers that tax litigation is fundamentally litigation. Explain what you mean. Well, um, I think that, you know, tax litigation is like any other litigation in that what is litigation? I always say that litigation is about, uh, this is my favorite definition of litigation or description of litigation. What is litigation and what are, who are litigators? Litigation is about competitive storytelling. That's what it is. You know, there are two sides, each with a story that is built out of facts and law. 
uh, and told in a way that's persuasive. That's what litigation is. Tax litigation is no different. You're doing the same thing. It's just different subject matter. Uh, so, you know, if you're litigating a case involving contracts or torts or administrative law, you're doing the same thing, except it's the subject matter is different. And yeah, the, ta- the concepts in tax are perhaps not as well understood and perhaps more arcane and more complicated. That just makes the task of storytelling uh, more difficult because you're trying to bring to life concepts that most people are intimidated by, which makes the, uh, the, the advocacy aspects even more important, right? So, but I, I don't, what I don't, the reason I said that was because people often, it's, it's law students often think, you know, I love tax law, and so I want, I think I should practice tax litigation. And my answer is, it, that, that doesn't follow. It doesn't follow because you're not practicing tax in the courtroom. You're not a tax solicitor. You're not there to just explain provisions of the code or the statute in the abstract sense. You are actually trying to deal with a real dispute, with real people, with real issues, and uh, through the construction of a narrative. And so I, I, said, I say that because I often hear people say, I love tax, so I think I'm going to do tax litigation. And I, and I say, well, it, it doesn't really follow. You, you need to think of yourself as a litigator who has a really good grasp and an understanding of tax as a subject matter. That, that's sort of the way I, I describe it. How can a young person become a good storyteller? You know, I read, uh, I read something by an American judge, and I can't, this was in the last couple of years. I read um, an article about advocacy by this U.S. judge. It was really, it was, a, it was a piece in, I think, the ABA litigation journal. And this judge starts off by saying, most lawyers are terrible storytellers. You know, he says, they're just not naturally good storytellers. And I thought to myself, why is that? Why is it that lawyers are not naturally good storytellers? And I think it's because we tend to think of law, we tend to think of the issues we're dealing with as a, you know, we, we, think, of, we think of the law as facts. And then we think of, you know, cases. And we think of statutes. We don't think of these things holistically, you know, and we bring an overly Cartesian perspective to it. We're, we're masterful at reductionist reasoning, you know. But if you, if you were to sit down with a great novelist and have a conversation with her about how she thinks of a story, well, she doesn't think about facts. She thinks about the protagonist. She thinks about the plot. She thinks about whether the way the story ends is appealing. She thinks about, uh, well, when she's telling you the story, what, does, what, what are you going to think of her story? Are you going to think this is an interesting story? Are you, are you going to think this is fun? Are you going to think the character is sympathetic? You know, so I think that what you should, what, 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 what becoming a great storyteller is about thinking like a storyteller. And the way you think like a storyteller is you read great books. You watch other storytellers. You, uh, you pay homage to the arts. You know, you, you, uh, you, go, you go to, you know, go to the play. You know, I mean, like, try and remove yourself a bit from sort of that Cartesian reductionist thing that we lawyers do and indulge yourself in, in, in things that are more holistic and, and, and are, 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 more, are more relatable to the human mind and to the human spirit, you know? Um, and, and that's why, you know, you, I always say to young advocates who work with me when we work on a case, if you were to go home and explain this case to your spouse, would you cite this section of the legislation and that case Or would you say, John bought some shares in a company, and he got these dividends, and then he did this with them, and he didn't pay any taxes, and the government says he should pay taxes because of that. I said, you could get through a story without any of those other bits of lawyering. 
And you should think about it that way and, and, and try and turn facts into, into, into stories that way. I don't know. I mean, I, I really have – this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say is that I think that, that great litigators, all of the ones that I've observed, are just phenomenal storytellers. Uh, they really bring the thing to life. Uh, and you can't bring the thing to life if you just think like a lawyer. But this, of course, is against, we're tax lawyers. This is against a backdrop of a code, thousands of pages of regulations. I mean, lots of pronouncements and, and precedent. So you've got to weave that in. How do you do that and not undermine sort of the flow of your story? I think the way you do that is so, – so here's, here's something that has been very helpful for me. And it's what I call the why and the how of a case. Uh, the art of persuading a judge has two quite distinct questions. The first question that the judge has in his or her mind, or you should assume the judge has on his or her mind, is, tell me, why should I decide this case for you? Are you on the right side? Does your result make sense? I mean, is this, is this a sensible outcome? So why should I decide the case for you? And the second quite distinct question is, if I'm convinced that I should decide this case for you, can you tell me how I do that? And if you keep those questions separately, you can weave all of the code provisions and the you know, history and the cases. That's more about the how. And the why doesn't have as much to do with it. I'm not suggesting these are completely watertight compartments, but there's an emphasis on each. And the why part is about appealing to intuition, good judgment, common sense, or comfort with the result. And the how part is about justifying that outcome by reference to legal doctrines and statutes, etc. So I say that if you, if you start by keeping the two separately, by the time you finish your journey of persuasion, you will have brought the thing together masterfully. And it, it for, speaking for myself, I think a case is that way, and it seems to work. That reminds me, you had a conversation with Chief Judge ba Bowman in 2010, you and a colleague, Scott Wilkie. And you asked him about his philosophy of judging. And by the way, on another occasion, you credited him as perhaps the most important tax judge in the history of Canada, and, and you've spoken very highly of Chief Judge Bowman, and you ask him about his philosophy of judging and whether he's a textualist or an activist, and he said, uh, somewhat uh, unsatisfactorily, that it depends on the case, that he looks for the fair sort of common sense result, and then whether he's an activist or a textualist depends on how much support he can find in the text. Yeah. Uh, and he, he said over his 40-year career, he really never had an occasion in which after figuring out in, to his own satisfaction what the fair common sense result is, he couldn't find support to justify that conclusion, which struck me as, you know, that's an activist, you know, and a textualist only when convenient. I, is that your experience in Canadian courts? I'm not sure that's my experience in Canadian courts. That's my experience with certain judges, I, but I don't think that's a uniformly held view. I mean, I, I think it's, it's funny that Bowman, Chief Justice Bowman said that because uh, Chief Justice Bowman was uh, the judge who wrote the first case. In Canada, interest deductibility, interest expense is regarded as a capital outlay. It's been part of our law forever that interest is always capital, and you have to find a specific provision in the statute to allow you to deduct it. There is no, it's not regarded as a general business expense ever. But Don Bowman decided one year it was, and he wrote a judgment uh, that interest expense could, in many circumstances, be a, just a routine, ordinary business expense, and therefore did not need to meet the requirements, the explicit codified requirements in the statute. And of course, it went up, and he was reversed by the upper, uh, the upper courts. So the point is that uh, he, he may not have been able to find many cases where he couldn't get to the result, but the appellate courts did find a way <laughs> to reverse on those cases. But, you know, the thing about him was I, I always said that he was a great – I've always believed that he was the great, one of the great jurists of Canadian tax law because he had what I think is uh, a quality that great jurists have, and that is an exceptionally supple intellect. You know, he was, he was, he was not brittle in his thinking, 
and he had this ability to nuance things and you know he was playful with the law uh, he was he was he, he, he never he, ne he understood that the law was instrumental it was it was attempting to achieve something that law in and of itself um, has limited purpose that that it's 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 how we govern society and how we you know we're trying to do something with it so he had this very pragmatic instrumentalist view of the law um, and he was very much a guy who uh, you know relied on intuition and common sense uh, but he was very skilled uh, with with the statute it was it was a plaything for him I, and I don't mean that pejoratively meaning he wasn't intimidated by it he could he wouldn't look at the book and say with the code and say wow I'm, I'm confined I mean if I get this wrong what's gonna happen he was he was a very courageous judge and that's the reason I said he was such a great jurist is because that's how jurists move the law forward right they you know they they it, uh, the story decisis is all about two steps forward and one step back and so so he, I don't, I don't, I don't think that he was typical of uh, tax jurists, but that's why I said that he was one of the best. Well, your, your compliments for him in that regard seems to create a tension because on another occasion in 2014, you were asked whether the courts have a role in combating tax avoidance, and you said properly understood, no, that's the legislature's role. The role of the court is simply to apply the law as written and not, not to move the law in any direction, two steps forward and one step back or not. Uh, is that still your view? It's still my view. I mean, look, uh, I, I think there's a difference between what I think courts should do and the real life experiences of a courtroom. You know, we, I, I'm a firm believer that there has to be a, there, there has to be a, 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 a big difference between the role of the legislature making tax policy and the role of the courts in interpreting law. I, I think that is an essential element of healthy democratic societies because tax law is fundamentally about political choices. It's about who's going to pay what when. And there are some deeply complex policy questions involved, trade-offs. And so people often don't appreciate that tax law is a manifestation of some significant policy and political choices. And, we sh and, and, and healthy democratic societies leave that to, to legislatures to do. So I'm a firm believer in that. But I also understand the realpolitik of courtrooms and that judges are human beings. And they, as I always say to my, the lawyers who work for me, and, and they know this line, if any of them ever listen to this podcast, they're going to laugh because they hear it from me every day when they come in with an argument that they think we should make. And I go, there's no way that judge can go home and sell, sell that argument to his or her spouse tonight. So we're not flying that argument, right? Meaning I understand that the, the, the reality of a courtroom, but that doesn't stop me from discouraging judges from going down that road. If you've got a case that may not be all that sympathetic, how, how do you appeal to a judge to be a textualist and let the result uh, uh, stay? Because, you know, uh, even the most, uh, well, I shouldn't say the most unsympathetic case Many, many unsympathetic cases, even very unsympathetic cases, still have two sides to the argument. And it's about making sure that they understand the other side of the argument. So I often say to them, and I'm, I'm often, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm often forthright with them. And I'll say, you know, if this result troubles you, I understand why. I understand why it troubles you, and maybe this result ought not to prevail uh, when they have a debate in the legislature. But if, but, but if we are going to maintain institutional integrity, and I, I always say this to judges, your first duty, your first duty above every duty is to make sure that taxpayers who come before you don't see you as the government's watchdog, because your institutional integrity and role relies on being perceived as being above the fray. You have to guard that with everything you have. Everything else is secondary. And when you decide that this case is unsympathetic and therefore I'm going to do this, you could be perceived and you'll be seen as coming off the bench and becoming essentially part of the federal government. And I think that, that that's not just idle chatter. That's a very serious issue. And judges understand that. And I also often say to judges, you know, legislatures don't like to take 
tough decisions. They like to pass hot potato questions to courts. And you ought not to be easily conscripted into that exercise. Let them make the tough decisions. Let them make the policy trade-offs. Don't give them cover by deciding these cases in a particular way. And I think those are compelling public policy virtues. And often, uh, and, and they often succeed. They succeed in our courts more than they've succeeded in the U.S. courts. Our courts are far more respectful of, of those institutional roles than, than I think the U.S. courts are. Transfer pricing obviously generates a lot of controversy. The arm's length standard governs the application of transfer pricing in the U.S. and Canada. Do, do you think that arm's length standard is a good standard for administration? No. Um, let, me, let me summarize. Let me put it this way. It's a great standard in the easy cases. It's not, but when the cases are complicated, it becomes an exceptionally uncertain standard. And the thing that I, the thing about that standard that I particularly find objectionable is that it veers very quickly away from fundamental legal principles into esoteric economics, right? The debate becomes very uncertain because the debate becomes a debate between experts. And these, these debates are often unhinged from legal standards. The virtue of legal standards is they're predictable, that, they, that you can make decisions in a certain way and somebody who is engaged in a particular commercial transaction has some visibility as to how it's going to turn out. But in the very, very difficult cases, you know, be they guarantee fees, implicit support, uh, intangibles, and the very difficult cases where you veered away from, you know, comparables into profit splits and residual profit methodology, you are almost out to sea uh, without any real legal moorings to the standard. So I think it's problematic. Now, having said that, if your next question is what's a better way to go, I don't have an answer to that. I think that's a, that's, that's, that's a more complicated question. But I think we need to rethink the role of that standard um, in, in, in the difficult cases that we deal with. Well, a lot of people would raise their hand and say, we've been advocating formulary apportionment for 30 years. That's the better standard to which you say, Yes, and I think that some very prominent American academics and practitioners have said that. Uh, I must confess that I don't think of myself as having sufficient expertise to comment on that. I don't, you know, as I said before, I'm really a litigator with a lot of tax expertise, but I don't have so much expertise that I could offer thoughtful views on that. But as a litigator who does transfer pricing cases, I've seen these debates become, as I say, unmoored from legal principles, and they spiral out of control, and then you really don't know which way. It gives the judge too much of a white canvas to paint on. With, with their, 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 the guardrails don't exist in the difficult cases. But, I, but as to whether formulary appropriation uh, is the right way to go, I, I, I just don't know. There's been a lot of talk about harmful tax competition among countries. Do you have a view on that? I think the phrase is... Uh, uh, the, the, the phrase is, you know, the Wall Street Journal writes about tax competitiveness and the New York Times writes about harmful, you know, whatever, meaning the phrase itself is imbued with a particular political perspective that we all ought to get together and maintain. You know, as somebody described some of the OECD work recently as basically let's get together and create a cartel uh, when it comes to taxes. Um, my sense is that here's, here's the thing about, you know, when I was asked this question before, I said, I'm not sure that it's practical in a world economy where different states have different competitive advantages and different objectives. The idea that you are going to bring harmony in the long term in a certain and predictable way particularly in democracies where governments are changing all the time, different political parties take power with different perspectives and have different constituencies that they're loyal to, the idea that this thing can hold together in the very long term, in my mind, is doubtful. So I, the rhetoric is nice, but it's pretty impractical to formulate tax policy on that basis. Did you ever have interest in being, being a judge or going back into the government in some, some capacity? Not to be a judge, um, I, I, you know, and I, and I, I know what I'm about to say. I've, I've said it before, and, 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 and I have immediately been accused of completely false modesty. 
So with that caveat, the reason that I've never thought about being a judge is because I just don't think I have the temperament for it. Uh, and I think the best quality of the best judges is temperament. If somebody, if somebody cited, you know, what is the one quality that you would love in a judge? It's great judicial temperament. And I just am not convinced that I have that essential ingredient. What, what, what aspect makes I think you unsuited that, for it? I think, that, I think that you need to be incredibly patient and you need to, um, you need to have, uh, you, you need to have a deep interest in, 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 in a lot of detail, but you also need a deep interest in what, what I colloquially describe as the academic aspects of the legal issues that you're entertaining, right? You have to genuinely be interested in the background and the academic analysis. That's, that's just not something that I do well. I'm, I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't th I don't think that I have the attention span and the patience and the interest to do all of that. And so I think that it would, it would I, I, I just, and, and frankly, I don't think I would enjoy it. I don't, I don't think sitting in chambers, writing a judgment and making sure that you've got every sentence right and making sure that somebody doesn't misunderstand and laboring over it, I, I just, it's not something that I don't think, I don't think I'm temperamentally suited to that. Going back to the government, I've often thought about it. You know, uh, I think it would, I've, I've often said to myself, it would be fun to, uh, to go back and undo some of, the, uh, some of the cases that I've succeeded in. <laughs> but I'm only saying that, you know, I, it's some moments I laugh at the prospect of doing that. Looking back, do you think you would have done anything differently if you knew then what you know now? You know, um, I, it's, a, it's such a great question, and it's often asked. And I, and I always end up not giving a particularly satisfactory answer, so I, I'm not sure this answer will be particularly satisfactory. But I think that, that the one thing that, is, that comes with age and experience and seniority at the bar and, you know, people – your phone ringing more than it did when you were young, is courage. And what I mean by courage is the ability to make a decision that your story is going to be X and your strategy is going to be X and having enough courage and confidence that you stick with it and go with that. Because when you're young, you are uncertain and you don't have courage. And there are four possible paths. There are four possible arguments. And so you want to make sure that you put every one of those on the table so that, you know, if path A is wrong, then at least, you, at least you put path B out there. And that manifests in many ways. You've got three alternative arguments. You're going to make them all, as opposed to saying, you know, I think that alternative argument number one is the best and the other two are distant, and I'm not going to make them because I want to show the judge I'm confident. Or um, there's a fact witness who has, who's a really good fact witness, but has some problems in the evidence. You know, I'm going to put that fact witness in the box, and I'm going to start with the problems. I'm going to go headlong into the issue. So it's that, what, that, that sort of courage comes with experience, and it comes with temperament, and it comes with security. And I, I wish I had developed that earlier, you know. And so I always say that the way that I, the metaphor that I always use is that when you're young and afraid, you're always running away from the fire. But when you're older and more mature and you have some courage, you're always running towards the fire because you know that your case is going to turn on putting out the fire, right? And if you if you flinch, if you don't take on the hard parts of your case, you know the judge is going to think about that. So it's, that, it's, 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 it's a natural tendency when you're young and starting out and you're not so confident and you're not so certain and you're intimidated by the difficult parts of your case to kind of stay away from them, to push away, not to really address them. Um, and, to, and, to, and, and to highlight the best parts of your case, to talk about you know, the things about your case that are great. 
But really, the things about your case that are great don't need that much attention. <laughs> you know, the thing that needs attention is the part of your case that's a problem. And when you're young, you feel like you can somehow smother the hard parts of your case with the good parts of your case. And that is a mistake and because you mostly you can't. And, and so, so I, I say, and I know I'm sort of repeating the same metaphor here. Is so I say to the young lawyers that come into my office and we're preparing for a th case, there are two rules that I always apply to them, and I have a short temper when I see these not being followed. Number one is don't cheerlead the case. I don't want to hear how good our case is. I already know that. I'm actually trying to play down how good our case is. I want to know how bad our case is. I'm more concerned about how I'm going to lose this case than how I'm going to win it. Because winning cases with great stuff is not as hard as not losing it because of the things that don't work for you. So I think it's just a way of kind of turning things around in the way you approach things. Could I have done that when I was young? I'm not sure because I think this is a matter of maturity and experience. Which of your cases are good, is a good example of you putting the problem up front and diffusing it? So probably the greatest example is a case called Cameco Corporation. It's probably one of the leading transfer pricing cases in Canada. And um, we worked on the case for years. And before, just before we went to trial, uh, I remember this very vividly. It was about six weeks before we went to trial. And I was in England on a holiday, six, maybe eight weeks before we went to trial. And I got a call from our team. They were working on the case in Toronto. And they phoned me and they said, uh, I remember him saying this, the lawyer who called me, said, um, I, 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 are you sitting down? And I said, no, I'm not sitting down. He goes, well, maybe you want to sit down or something like that. And then he said, look, Al, we just uh, found a memo that was written by a senior person that described the structure that we're litigating as the house of cards. And it's very critical of all our transfer pricing, expresses concerns about the tax planning. And this is a senior guy in the company. And the memo was written at the time that the structure was sort of put in place. It was a pretty damning document. It was, it was on its face. It, it really looked, it was problematic. And so we spent some time. And I said, we're putting him in the box and we're putting the memo to him. And we're going to ask him to explain why he said that. And we took him through it very, 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 in a lot of detail. Um, and at the end of the day, our case was, okay, this is a guy who is a business person, doesn't really understand the transfer pricing rules, doesn't understand this is about pricing and that, yes, uh, tax planning is permitted. He's coming at it very viscerally, which is what you're not supposed to do. And the judge agreed with us and didn't pay any attention to it. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would have responded to that memo the same way many years ago, but it was probably the most most interesting example of, of that type of a situation. You deal with some very big, high-profile, high-pressure cases. How do you, do you, do you have a mechanism to deal with the pressure to stay healthy? You know, I just, I just try and follow age-old wisdom, diet, exercise, meditate. Well, meditate, I suppose, is, is a bit out of the ordinary, but a bit of that. But just manage stress through other things. And, you know, and, the, and, and just remember that you know, uh, 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 when I was a young lawyer, there was a uh, very senior, the, 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 the man, the, the lawyer who was the dean of our bar, and I'll mention him because I, I, he was a pretty remarkable guy. He, he's now, I think, almost retired or retired. His name was Warren Mitchell, and he argued many, many of the great Canadian cases. I remember him saying to me once, we were talking about, because he was, he was never stressed. He, nev he never felt any of this. He, he was always you know, very sort of jovial, light. He could be in the middle of the biggest case, and you could see he, he didn't wear it, but he was so effective. So I asked him the question, and I said, well, what's, what's your secret? And he said, look, it's very simple. Uh, this isn't my problem. I'm trying to help somebody solve their problem. So I have to create a bit of distance between me and the case. And when I think about it that way, he said, it doesn't mean I don't care. I care, but it makes me a far better advocate because it allows me to create some distance between the case and myself. It allows me to view it a bit more objectively and with my mind rather than becoming emotionally, you know, taken by the case. So I look at it and I say, well, this is put some distance. So I said, 
So I always think about this as my job is to help taxpayers or clients solve their problem, not to make it my problem, right? That's the one thing. And the second thing, and I, I think he was only half joking, but I'm not sure he was entirely joking. He said, and I never read cases after I've argued them. Once, they, once I've argued the case, the judgment is out. Unless it's an appeal, I, I don't even bother. I may browse through it, but I don't really read it with that. Like, I'm on to the next one, you know? So very sort of a, a very sort of a, a, keeping a bit of distance from the problem you're dealing with and yourself, but being fully engaged in it intellectually, but not allowing yourself to become too engaged in it emotionally. And that's a hard thing to do, but if you can do it, it's really effective. You've spoken about meditation in the past. Can you just elaborate a little bit on how you use it? Well, I try and meditate every day. Um, it's part of a routine. Um, and it's a very hard thing for me to do. It, it's not easy, but I've gotten better at it. And I, I see results from it. I, I actually have seen very positive results from it in terms of my well-being and frankly and this is the part that may surprise people my ability as an advocate because what is what is meditation all about if you were to you know I, I, somebody I, I, I gave a lecture once at, at a university um, titled the mindful advocate and I was trying to explain to these law students right you know these classic young Cartesian reasoners who live completely the life of the mind you know, who, I mean, that's what it's all about. And trying to explain to them, what, what is this meditation thing? And I, I, I used the metaphor used in, by, I think it was a, a, a Buddhist monk, who, who said, he described meditation as this. He said, you know, he said, you should think of the mind as, as a jar full of water that's kind of muddy. And it's shaking all the time. You know, that's what your mind is doing. And he said, but what if you could just settle your mind so that the dirt settles to the bottom and then your mind is the rest of the water that's completely clear? Wouldn't you be far more effective if you could do that with your mind as opposed to keep shaking the jar with the muddy water? And I thought that so cleverly captured what meditation is all about. It's about clarity. It's about clarity of the mind. And I was trying to pitch to these kids that I know you want to be great lawyers. Well, which, which of those minds is going to make you a better lawyer? And I thought that the metaphor using the clarity of the mind captured it. And I think it's a very accurate metaphor. And I think it's exactly what it's about. The practice is difficult, but the benefits are pretty good. You've shared a lot of advice in this conversation, but do you have any other advice for young lawyers starting out their careers, thinking about their careers? Uh, I think my, my single biggest advice, if the one piece of advice I could give them is, you know, look at my career. I didn't end up where I ended up because I had a grand strategy at the beginning. I didn't start out saying, okay, I'm going to go to law school, then I'm going to become a tax lawyer, then I'm going to go to the court, then I'm going to go to Harvard, then I'm going to go to the Department of Justice. None of that was planned. Almost everything that happened to me, and I think almost everything that happens to the advocates, the successful ones, and the, pers the, the people who are happy doing what they're doing, you know, because our well-being is important. It's not just about work. Is that they allowed, they allowed the universe to kind of open up for them, meaning they weren't, they weren't so married to any course of action that, and, and, and they didn't just have their eyes on the road ahead without looking at what, you know, so far down the road that they weren't able to see what's b before them or around them. Meaning opportunities will come. Change may come. You may wake up one morning and say, you know, I don't really know if I want to do this. I'm going to try something else. Or, you know, I've got a ch an opportunity to try uh, a case that's not related to tax. Or I have a, open yourself up to, op to, to different things. Make yourself you know, make your, make your mind and your spirit available to explore and to experience different things. And you'll be surprised that things that come to you, and some you'll take advantage of, some you'll make, give a pass to, 
you know, I, I once said, and this con- this quote taken in context makes sense, taken out of context makes no sense. But I, I, I just said, I, I once said to, uh, to in this interview that I gave at the University of Toronto Law School that a planned life is not worth living. And what I meant by that was don't plan your life so much so that you're not seeing. Uh, and don't be afraid to try new things. That's the one thing. And the second thing, second piece of advice I give them is don't confuse being uh, a great advocate with just learning the law. The law is an essential tool. Learning skills, learning how to do a cross-examination, learning how to read a statute, learning how to write a brief. Those are skills, and they're essential elements to being a great advocate or a great lawyer. But they're not sufficient. To be great, to be exceptional, to be and to be happy at this, you need to think like a storyteller. You need to think artistically. You need to think creatively. So, you know, and those two things are not, they're not so distinct. They're, they're, they, they come together. When you allow yourself all of these opportunities and you do all of these things, you will naturally evolve. And I think it's going to be a, a far better experience and a more rewarding experience. You got your experience at the Department of Justice. Can young lawyers now get a similar experience in private practice, or do you recommend that they go to the Department of Justice if they do, if they think they do want a career as a tax litigator? You know, uh, I have to say it's far more difficult in the private bar, and it's not a problem just for Canadians. It's a problem in every jurisdiction because of the vanishing trial. You know, uh, And, and in, in uh, the Department of Justice, you have a lot more opportunity when you're young. So my advice, if somebody asked me that question, would be, Yes, you can get great experience and be very successful as a tax litigator in the private bar, but you have to be very careful where you go. You have to go to places that have really good tax litigators who can be mentors to you. you ha- they have a robust practice. They have work. They have a culture of inclusion. They have a culture of letting young lawyers get on their feet and make mistakes. They have a culture where they will push you hard. They will call you out when you're not showing up. So you, ha- you have to find the right place. And unfortunately, you know, that's not many, many places. So you have to be more selective in where you go if you're going to do it on the private side. And how do you distinguish yourself at a firm like that? Well, you know, I, I think that um, the, the, for, for me, uh, the way that I've picked the lawyers, the lawyers that I work with that I keep going to over and over and putting on my teams, is I sort of, you know, I, I look for things like, quite apart from work ethic, which is essential, but for intellectual curiosity, a uh, 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 fluid vocabulary, an ability to relate to concepts that are abstract, but in a way that makes them sensible. Like, I really do, you know, I, do, I really do search for those people with that supple intellect. I mean, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I love kids whose first degree was in the liberal arts because they read great books and they know how to write a sentence and they understand, you know, there's a fluidity to the way they think. Or I love kids who, whose first degree is in the pure sciences because there's complexity, you know. So I'm not a believer that you have to really understand business to be a great litigator or you really have to know how to do, you know, debits and credits. You know, all the things... All the things that we need to understand in particular cases, we'll learn. What I want is the right mind. I can teach you the skills, but I can't teach you. I, can, I, have, I have only a limited ability to help you think in a supple way. So those are the things that we look for. And, you, and the way you distinguish yourself is by showing those things, by being courageous, by dissenting. So I, I'm in meetings with young lawyers all the time. And when a young lawyer uh, sitting around the table dissents from some trial strategy we're thinking about, but does it thoughtfully and with conviction, even if they're dead wrong, that works for me. Those are the kinds of things I look for. It shows courage. Yes. And it shows, and it shows, uh, it show, it also, but as long as it's thoughtful, it shows that the, these, the, they, they can, to use a terrible um, metaphor, but it's, it's one that we employ all the time, they can think out of the box. You know, I mean, I don't really like that, but, but it's, a, it's a good way to put it. Your comments now make me uh, uh, think of a book called In Defense of Troublemakers, yes. which is written by a University of California Berkeley uh, professor. Uh, and I would recommend it to, to young lawyers because it highlights the importance of non-consensus thinking, of thinking out of the box and standing up for yourself, displaying courage. It improves every decision. 
You know, there's another book, and I'm going to recommend it because it was written by a friend of mine, and it didn't get the, the acclaim that it did. It's a book called The Power of Dissent, and it's by a guy whose name is Robert Kaplan. He's a Canadian, uh, William Kaplan, uh, who is a Canadian uh, lawyer. He was a law professor at the University of Ottawa, a very erudite guy who's written lots of different books on you know, about law and stuff. And he wrote a book about dissent, and there are several chapters in there on the great dissenters and the changes they brought to, you know, to, to institutions and cultures and societies. It's a very powerful book, which demonstrates that, uh, that groupthink is a problem. And so, you know, and, and, and so, but there are books, there are several books like that. And um, I, I, I think you're right when you, when, you, when you articulate that view. Troublemakers, we love troublemakers as long as they deliver. Al, thanks very much. Matt, a pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. We'll leave it there. That's it for this, uh, this episode. Uh, until next time, thank you for listening.